On March 10, 1915, the Virginia General Assembly enacted the Virginia Prohibition Act. It went into effect on November 1, 1916. It outlawed the production, distribution, and the sale of alcohol across the state. As a result, Virginia experienced a complicated relationship with alcohol. Today, we'll visit the Valentine Museum and explore more of this hidden history. The temperance movement began in the 1800s and focused on limiting alcohol consumption. Rachel Asbury Cole works in the collections department at the Valentine Museum and will share more information about the temperance movement and share artifacts that help tell the story of prohibition in Richmond. So Rachel, we're here to talk about prohibition, but tell me a little bit about alcohol use before prohibition in Virginia. Virginians have always been big drinkers, dating all the way back to colonial times. Taverns, saloons, drinking clubs were all important sites of of social and political interaction. But we also have a really long history of alcohol production here in the state as well. Everything from wine, beer, cider, both legal and illegal liquor as well. Alcohol is big business. Richmond in particular has always been a big beer producer. That's what we've got in this display case right here. It's historic and contemporary bottles from several of the breweries in our area. What was happening around the US and in Virginia for prohibition to even be considered? In the mid to late 19th century, you really start to see a lot more legal regulations being placed on both alcohol production and consumption. Virginia starts to tax liquor sales in 1877, and there are a lot of licensing requirements on who can serve and sell alcohol. At the same time, you're starting to get this competing belief of the fear of alcohol that's driven by the temperance movement. Tell me about the temperance movement. The temperance movement wants to limit alcohol consumption on moral grounds. There's this overwhelming fear that drunkenness and alcohol is going to cause all of these societal ills, things like poverty, crime, it's gonna tear the family apart. And so you have organizations like the Women's Christian Temperance Union and the Anti-Saloon League really start to lobby against the liquor industry. One of the main things that they're supporting is a lot of these legal regulations, but the other thing they are really pushing the General Assembly to do is to pass Ask the local option. It allows counties and cities to independently vote on whether they want to allow alcohol sales and consumption in that jurisdiction. Virginia actually passes the Virginia Prohibition Act. They vote on it in 1914 and it goes into effect November 1st, 1916. That's actually four years before national prohibition goes into effect with the 18th Amendment. So you've got liquor restrictions in Virginia far before it goes nationwide. How do communities respond to the banning of alcohol? Alcohol. Virginia really starts to experience the second civil war, and this is between the wets and the dries. Prohibition absolutely does not stop the flow of alcohol in Virginia. Instead, it just pushes the alcohol industry underground. So you start having this overall network of the illegal booze industry with bootleggers, moonshiners, speakeasies. Alcohol is still there. It's just a little bit harder to get your hands on. So we have some artifacts here that really help us tell the story story of prohibition here in Richmond. Tell me what we have here. These two bottles represent two businesses that were directly impacted by the Virginia Prohibition Act. Next to you is a whiskey jug. This was retailed by Phil Kelly. He was a whiskey and liquor wholesaler. That's a one gallon jug and could hold uh, any type of whiskey that you wanted from his business and would cost two to five dollars. Next to me, we've got this great, actually still full bottle of Rainwater Madeira. That's a type of fortified wine. And this one was retailed by RL Christian and Company. They are a fancy grocer. So they sell imported fine table goods, wines, and liquors. These bottles give us a glimpse of the effects of prohibition. Kelly was out of business for good, although RL Christian kept the non-liquor Richmond business open for another decade. We decided to visit a modern day speakeasy, Grand Staff and Stein, to learn more about this big part of prohibition history. What makes a speakeasy? So they started off overseas, the chart police. Uh, eventually made its way to Australia, and then it made it to America in the 1800s. And it was basically a saloon that was unlicensed. How would you get into a speakeasy? So, word of mouth. Generally, there was a password. We keep on theme with that here. The whole idea was to speak easy inside the place, and that's how the knowledge got around, speaking softly and quietly and not alerting the authorities to what was happening inside this place. 
What do we know about the enforcement or how law enforcement tried to regulate or, or shut these places down? The police knew about these places and they also would hang out there too. If you were a smuggler or you know, you had some dirty business, as long as you do the right police officers, they hung out with you, they kind of turned a blind eye to it as well. Speakeasies are also referred to as a blind tiger or a blind pig. Do you know anything about that? Places would have an animal. Sometimes it would literally be an imported pig and you would pay your fee to go see this animal and then a complimentary cocktail was given to you. Or there was also setups where it was like a pool hall and there was a drawer in the wall and you would actually place your money in the drawer, slide the drawer into the wall, you open the drawer back up, there's your drink. So Blind Tiger was kind of like, you didn't know who the owner was. That way nobody was guilty of anything. You just have to put money in a drawer and there's a drink. What was the quality of the alcohol that was served? It was bad. I mean, it was all moonshine, bootlegging. It actually kind of changed the cocktail scene that got away from the classic early 1900s cocktails. During that time, people actually started prefer to drink their liquor straight. because It's almost like you proved yourself. Implementing prohibition in Virginia proved difficult. Resistance from local communities, underfunding, and heavy-handed enforcement hindered creating a dry Virginia. Bootleggers and speakeasies were thriving, and the police were accused of turning a blind eye. In reaction to public pressure, local officials stepped up enforcement in 1922. Rather than raiding bootleggers in illicit establishments, attention was turned to rural moonshiners, disproportionately affecting black farmers who turned to distilling grain crops into alcohol. What is the legacy of prohibition? One of the main things that happens post-prohibition, once it's repealed nationally in 1933, is that you still have a lot of desire for regulations around alcohol production and consumption. So in Virginia, that's where you see the creation of the Department of Virginia's Alcoholic Beverage Control. We've still got the ABC board today that puts all of the laws and rules into effect on alcohol production and consumption. There's speakeasies all around DC and a couple. There's uh, one in Charlottesville called the Alley Light. So the, the concept is definitely coming back and it's a trend in New York too. In 1933, Virginia ratified the 21st Amendment, repealing prohibition. And although it ended the lore of the speakeasy, they will always be a part of Virginia's hidden history. Mm -hmm.